Thank you, Allie. I'm going to share my screen. OK. All right, can we see it? Are we good? Yeah, it looks great. I love your slide. Thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Dupuy, and I'm presenting along with my colleague Eli Alston Snepitz on a project we're working on right now that's focused on the electrification of affordable multifamily housing. To give you an outline, after we give you some context on our study's background and policy landscape, Eli is going to talk about the developer experience of affordable multifamily housing, and I'll be talking about the experience of occupants. We are the Market Transformations Research Team led by Dr. Sarah Outkult. This project is funded by the California Energy Commission and it's part of a larger study of zero net energy and all electric housing led by EPRI. Our role in the project was to explore customer perceptions of ZNE and all electric housing. Because we're talking about affordable housing, we broke the customer group down into two different groups. So first the developers who are building the communities and the occupants who rent the apartments. Quickly, before we get into anything else, here are the definitions we used for the various types of housing we looked at in the study. All electric means that energy consuming appliances are powered by electricity and there is no fossil fuel combustion on site. Zero net energy communities are those where the annual energy consumption is offset by on-site renewable energy production. ZNE ready communities incorporate the efficiency measures necessary for ZNE to achieve a comparable EUI, but they lack the ability to generate on-site. While ZNE buildings are often all electric, they can be mixed fuel. The last category that's also typically lumped in with these types is zero net carbon, but none of the communities we looked at were actually ZNC. Our team used multiple, a multiple case study design. We combined literature review and historical analysis to better understand the landscape of affordable multifamily housing in California and the context in which these communities exist. Topics of interest included state and city level policy related to decarbonization and adoption of new technologies like gas bans and reach codes, accessibility to and knowledge of existing and new technologies among developers, affordable multifamily housing financing mechanisms, and characteristics of affordable multifamily housing in California, such as supply to demand and location. We then conducted in-depth interviews with affordable housing developers and phone surveys with occupants. Eli and I will talk about the interview and survey methods during our respective deeper dives. So experts have identified electrification as one of the best ways to decarbonize and accomplish the state goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. New construction has been the target of many electrification initiatives. While there are been many benefits to electrification, we must consider potential burdens or shortfalls. Specifically, it's very important to transition affordable housing in the near term. There's a lot of speculation that due to aging gas infrastructure maintenance and transition away from gas, that natural gas prices will increase. So it's important to safeguard low income individuals from the fate of having those individuals being the only ones stuck on the gas grid with high gas prices because they were the only ones who couldn't afford to make the initial electrification switch. Though the state of California has overall goals and visions for the future, there's no state level electrification mandate that exists today. Electrification proponents are hoping for and speculating about an electrification favorable statewide Title 24 building code in the next code cycle, which is 2022, and an all electric code in 2025. But in the absence of top-down legislation, many communities have taken sustainability initiatives on themselves, and 44 cities have adopted gas bans or reach codes that, that phase out the use of gas in new construction. New legislation has been coming out that encourages electrification of new construction, including Senate Bill 1477, which established the BUILD program through which developers can get funding. The low income housing tax credit is the most frequently utilized funding source for development of multifamily affordable housing. While the funding is federal without stipulating environmental mandates, each state allocates the tax credits themselves and are allowed to determine their cri own criteria. In California, the tax credit allocation committee allocates funding based on criteria met in their qualified allocation plan. California's 2020 Qualified Allocation Plan requires developments to adhere to California's Title 24 Building Energy Efficiency Standards and also incentivizes green building design. Now I'm going to hand it off to Eli to give you background on the specific communities we studied. Thanks for that. So the three communities we chose represent diversity and technologies used as well as size and location. Um, St. Paul's Commons is a mixed use community development in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, the community sits on land adjacent to the church itself, which is owned by St. Paul's Episcopal Church. 
um, and they're actually leasing this land to RCD for a term of 77 years. So the ground floor of the building features a community space operated by the church. It's called the Trinity Center, and it's a drop-in service center for homeless and working poor adults. Uh, this space includes a commercial kitchen, laundry, and shower facilities. Um, and then above the community space are 45 residential units. Um, occupant incomes range from 30% to 60% of the area median income. Half of the apartments um, use rental subsidies, and that means that residents don't pay any more than 30% of their incomes. Um, in addition, half of the units serve as California fully supportive permanent housing for residents with special needs or who have experienced homelessness in the past. And then two units are reserved for folks living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, St. Paul's is a Greenpoint rated all electric building featuring on site solar PV and an electric high efficiency centralized domestic water heating. Uh, they have packaged terminal air conditioners or PTAC units um, in all 45 units and in some of the larger units. Um, They're also used in combination with mini splits. Mutual housing at Spring Lake, uh, it's located right next to us actually in Woodland, California. It's an all electric zero net energy affordable housing community that's located within the larger Spring Lake development. Uh, it had two phases of construction, so one in 2015 and then one in 2019 for a total of 101 units, including both apartments and townhomes. Uh, the housing units are reserved for agricultural workers and their family, <coughs> excuse me, their families earn um, zero to 60% of the area median income. Uh, Spring Lake was certified 100% zero energy ready by the US Department of Energy. Um, and it also includes electric heat pumps for both space and water heating, uh, 209 kilowatt solar system, LED lighting and a tenant energy usage monitors in some units. The Nightingale is a supportive housing community in South Los Angeles. It has 30 units. Uh, occupant incomes range from 23% of the area median income to 30%. And, uh, and they're reserved for direct referrals from the Los Angeles County Coordinated Entry System and the Department of Health Services for those meeting homeless requirements. Uh, the Nightingale is LEED Gold certified. It's also certified ZNE ready and it features on-site solar PV as well. Uh, it's primarily all electric except for gas, which is used for the water heating. Um, and it's important to note on this one that the, the management actually pays for the gas service. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the developer's perspectives on electric and, and or ZNE affordable multifamily housing. Um, and I should mention when we use the term developer, we're using it kind of broadly to include um, project managers, asset managers, architects, contractors, sustainability consultants, energy consultants, even property managers and maintenance technicians. So we conducted 21 in-depth interviews with multiple actors, like I just mentioned, involved in the development, building and operation of all electric and or ZNE affordable housing. Uh, most of the interview subjects, actually 19 of them were affiliated with one of the specific communities I just outlined in the case studies. Um, but we also did speak to two other developers um, just to gain a wider perspective about affordable housing in California. So the three main findings emerged across the interviews were economics, risk, and mission alignment. And I'm going to speak about each one of those in a little bit more detail. So economics emerged as both a motivator and an obstacle. So building all electric or zero net energy housing was perceived to be one of the best ways to increase a developer's competitive edge for financing. Um, one project manager described the pressures of doing energy efficient design as stemming from the funders themselves. Um, she noted one funder encouraged a lot of sustainability measures, particularly the certifications like LEED to increase project scoring to get funded. And then describing the funder application process and scoring an asset manager explained each section has different points and you need to get more points to get the funding. You get more points for homeless housing, you get extra points for ZNE or lead rated. If you're trying to get competitive financing, being ZNE gives you an extra boost. Um, affordable housing is also often rent restricted. So building owners um, renting to assisted tenants have to establish a tenant utility allowance to keep the tenant expenditures fixed. So this means that affordable housing developers have to adjust the collected rent in accordance with the utility allowance. So for example, um, a higher utility allowance would um, imply a lower collected rent because the rent combined with the utility allowance has to total the permissible rent. So all electric plus solar can reduce utility allowances and increase those rents, improving project finances. So with the incorporation of on-site solar PV, the produced energy can either be allocated to residents directly um, proportionally by unit. And then if residents receive solar credits, they offset resident consumption and therefore lower residents utility bills. Um, in this scenario, with more solar credits allocated 
to offsetting the utility costs, the site can lower the utility allowance and then increase collected rent. So self-generating power and not drying from the grid also makes it possible to increase rental income while maintaining those fixed housing costs for residents by lowering their utility allowance. Um, and we can also talk more about this later since it can get a little confusing. Um, and then asset managers we spoke with seem to share a perception that the financial operation of all electric or ZME buildings is more difficult than with traditional buildings. Um, asset managers reported a lot of challenges with budgeting for utilities because they had no comparable buildings in their portfolio. Um, and then they didn't really trust the energy modeling to provide accurate estimates of electricity use. So one of the asset management directors um, described reaching out to a developer of another all electric building to ask if they might share their budgeting and that developer responded, we have no idea, we don't have any information either. Um, so developers, architects, and energy consultants discussed the difficulty of estimating the amount of electricity that would be used by tenants. So one of the architects described different modeling platforms yielding different results. So she said, one measurement requires you to include plug loads and one program will ask you to exclude plug loads. Further, she kind of talked about this historical disconnect between the way that energy is modeled and measured for compliance with building code and then what is actually most user dependent. Um, and so what she meant by that was that, you know, critical end uses like plug loads are excluded from demand calculations, but are in fact responsible for a significant and growing um, share of household energy use. And we already know that low income housing tends to have higher plug loads and, and uh, higher rates of electricity use. Um, the perceived level of risk associated with choosing to construct all electric or ZE building varied somewhat. So several interviewees expressed the sentiment that all electric was largely feasible. Um, and not too risky. Some noted that most affordable housing units tend to be primarily electric anyway, with water heating being the only thing that's really dependent on gas as compared to market rate housing, which often has gas cooktops or space heating. So the sustainability consultant echoed this sentiment um, saying that within affordable housing units, it's typically the water heater that he kind of called the, the paradigm shift. Um, so buildings that also provided commercial spaces like St. Paul's, like I mentioned, we're concerned about being able to supply enough hot water for both the residents as well as the folks coming in for the laundry shower and kitchen facilities. But even in that case, the worries weren't enough to kind of abandon the idea of decarbonization. A member of the development team on that project um, recalled a sort of communal epiphany at which um, at one of the meetings at which someone said it, it seemed kind of silly to think about a whole gas infrastructure for one stove. So some developers were worried about the installation of unfamiliar and potentially unreliable emerging technologies. And in one case, a developer actually instructed the energy consultant not to propose anything too esoteric. Um, some developers felt that they were taking on a necessary risk that was kind of thrust upon them by changes in the California Energy Commission policy and kind of making having to make large aspirational organizational changes. Um, but you know, it's, oh yeah, so he kind of described feeling, um, why do we need to be the test balloon? Why do we need to be out in front of this? But actual experience with the technologies installed suggested that the weariness was kind of warranted in at least two of the communities. There were um, initial issues with installation of the water heating, um, although that was eventually resolved. So a year or more beyond construction, it seems that developers worry a bit less about the emerging technologies. Um, as long as they kind of make it clear to the energy consultants that reliability and not innovativeness is their priority. And then the last thing that emerged in terms of risk was the idea of future proofing. So um, risks against the aging gas um, infrastructure. So one developer said the trade-off we had to think about was gas is currently cheaper, but where is that going? It seems unlikely that this will be the case in the future, that gas will continue to be cheaper. Um, so she said that that made them open to experimenting and not necessarily with something totally new, but the absence of something, um, namely gas. And so another architect uh, pointed out with regard to future risk, gas you will never self-generate on site, but electrical you have a chance. Um, and then the last factor that was referenced by nearly everyone involved is that doing all electric building was in line with their respective missions as organizations. So several interviewees expressed that their collective values were to be stewards of the communities that they build in and that going electric was viewed as kind of supporting this mission, providing housing at a minimum cost to themselves, to the residents, but also to the environment. Um, so, particularly with the potential for becoming ZNE, they saw that as translating directly to resident savings and then self-generating power and not drying from the grid would make it possible to increase rental income while maintaining fixed housing costs for the residents by lowering the utility allowance and then they could also build more units. Um, although some projects actually cost more upfront than the for-profit developments, um, affording housing developers are, are also aiming to build better buildings because they're going to have this building in their portfolio for 25 to 50 years. So um, as Sarah aptly pointed out in the conversation, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of 
um, building a house for yourself versus trying to flip one. So they're developers, but they're also owners. Um, and as one energy consultant described, it turns out the people who work as developers for affordable housing nonprofits, they care about housing, they care about communities, they also care about the planet. So in conclusion, with regard to economics, it seems that even if upfront costs are slightly higher, they're often offset by long-term savings. And then overall, building an all-electric or ZNE is becoming increasingly necessary to be competitive for financing. Um, the first all-electric or ZNE project feels and is often most risky in the eyes of developers. Uh, there's a lot of learning by doing for everybody involved in the project, but once the kinks are ironed out, the systems tend to require less maintenance overall. Um, and then even with these increased upfront costs and installation issues, developers felt overwhelmingly positive about the communities, and most were in the process of building additional all-electric and ZNE housing now. Um, and then I will also point out that is evidenced by the lack of explicit focus on electrification in the literature. And then from these conversations with developers, the overall lack of knowledge seems to be actually the biggest obstacle. So I think more studies on electrification and more avenues for sharing of knowledge between developers um, would really mitigate a lot of the obstacles that we covered. Um, and now Ashley's going to talk about the uh, occupant perspective. We conducted phone interviews with residents from each community that Eli identified with 81 total responses. Interviewees were asked about their overall satisfaction with their units, knowledge of technologies in their communities, what educational materials they were provided, their attitudes about energy related features and perception of importance of energy savings, as well as information about their bills and what plug loads they have in their units. In order to gauge knowledge of on-site technology and building type, we asked participants if they thought their buildings had on-site solar PV and gas service. All three communities have on-site solar. Spring Lake had the highest percentage of answers correctly identifying solar PE, PV, followed by Nightingale. So the lower percentages of awareness of on-site solar at St. Paul's and Nightingale might possibly be attributed to the location of the panels themselves. If the panels are on top of the roof, it's unlikely that occupants would be able to view them and thus would need to learn of the on-site solar via word of mouth or solar credits on utility bills. However, not everybody pays bills directly. Nightingale is the only community with natural gas service, which only serves the building's central water heating. So, however, Nightingale residents had the lowest correct response rate of identifying the presence of gas. This could be due to the fact that all of the appliances residents interact with in their units are electric and residents don't interact with the building's water heater. Additionally, we wanted to gauge occupants' knowledge of the designation of their communities as all electric or zero net energy. Both Spring Lake and St. Paul's had similar rates of correct responses at just under 50% when asked if they had heard their building described as all electric. Both Spring Lake and Nightingale are ZNE buildings, however, they had very low response rates of hearing their communities described as such. We asked occupants if they received information on water heating, air conditioning, space heating, dishwashers, thermostats, and plug loads when they moved in. Across all communities, only 20% of respondents stated that they had received information about water heating, and 80% of respondents said that they did not. Well, from the developer perspective, all electric water heating appliances such as central heat pump water heaters make the biggest difference to construction. It makes sense that there is little to no occupant education on water heaters because it is the most invisible technology to occupants. The majority of respondents said they did not receive information about how devices that are plugged in can still use energy even when they're turned off. This phenomenon is known as a phantom load, and phantom load education can be integral to keeping utility bills minimal, especially because low-income households historically have a high plug load and thus high electricity usage. One developer interviewee described the situation as low-income households being victimized by their own appliances. Spring Lake is one community that has gone above and beyond with education and outreach programs for the residents. Three prominent tactics employed in the community are the Green Guide, the Canary Device, and the Green Leaders Program. Upon move-in, residents of Spring Lake receive a binder with educational information on the green features of their community, best practices for a healthy home, including safe cleaning products, and overall environmentally conscious behaviors. Residents are walked through all of this information in an educational session, either with a large group during a lease-up event or individually with management or a community volunteer upon move-in. 
The canary device is an instrument employed in units built in phase one, which displays daily energy consumption in real time to occupants. The feedback is displayed in colors, so individuals of all ages, literacy levels, and languages can understand how much energy they've used over the course of the day on the cumulative side of the device, and how much energy they're using instantaneously on the real time side of the device when appliances are turned on or off. Spring Lake empowers residents to take ownership of their sustainable living styles and share ideas and accomplish community projects through the Green Leaders Program, a voluntary group where residents can engage with each other. Overall, members of these three communities had lower energy bills than they expected. 55.3% of participants at Spring Lake experienced lower bills, 28.6% of St. Paul's respondents and 62.5% of Nightingale's respondents identified that their energy bills are lower than they originally anticipated. None of the Nightingale's residents had bills higher than expected and under 30% of both Spring Lake and St. Paul's respondents experienced bills higher than expected. Additionally, on a scale of very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, not satisfied, or not sure, respondents across communities were overwhelmingly very or somewhat satisfied with their apartments. Across communities and technologies, respondents were satisfied with the air conditioning, heating, hot water, air quality, lighting, and number of plug outlets provided in their units. Respondents from St. Paul's have noticeably lower satisfaction with air conditioning and heating than Spring Lake and Nightingale. We think it may have something to do with the fact that they are using PTACs rather than heat pumps as in other communities. The PTACs may have more difficulty achieving comfortable conditions at extreme outdoor temperatures. Despite initial hiccups with improper installation of some of these technologies, such as water heating and air conditioning, residents have been resilient and overall satisfied with their units. We have forthcoming white papers and journal articles to be published in the coming months. If you would like to be updated on our future analysis and publications, please don't hesitate to contact Sarah, Eli, or myself. Thanks for your time, and we look forward to any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, you both. All right. Well, we have time for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat um, or raise your hand, and we can unmute you. And I'm going to put the emails that she just mentioned in the chat so you guys can have those as well. Thanks, Allie. Yeah. Okay, um, do you see the question in the chat? I'm happy to read it, but it's from um, Jeannie Marsh. She was wondering how much did the Canary devices help the residents? Eli, do you wanna take that or should I? I mean, the so the Canary was only uh, available to residents at Spring Lake. And in addition to that, it was only in some units. Um, so most of the respondents and on the occupant side um, didn't have ac actually have any sort of interaction with the Canary. Um, I think overall the occupants found it helpful, um, but I think there was also some confusion as to how it worked um, because of the way, I mean, Sarah could also probably speak to this because of the, the way it kind of presents the energy cumulatively. Sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, the, so as they said, the, there was a, a cumulative, me cumulative measure and an instantaneous measure. The one comment I recall that stood out um, that one of the developers told us was that um, it, it actually sort of um, made this very ominous red warning when folks uh, cooked. Um, and so it almost, right, because the stove uses a lot of energy, so in a way, it, it sort of looked like it was penalizing people for doing something they needed to do. Um, and so th that's partly why they didn't uh, roll it out into phase two as well, because it kind of scared people off and the residents felt like it was a little bit insensitive because, you know, cooking is a, is a sort of responsible way to um, feed yourself and your family. Um, and you, you shouldn't be telling people not to do it just because of the energy use associated. So they were, they were problematic, but you know, I think in general they have potential, but uh, didn't work very well in this particular context. One other thing I'll add is um, my discussion of phantom loads where 
if something's plugged in, even if it's not turned on, it's still pulling energy. Um, so people didn't really see much fluctuation in other devices other than cooking, like Sarah said, because they always had their TV plugged in or their game station plugged in. So like Sarah said, has potential, but could definitely be tweaked. All right. Well, they will, um, if they can, they'll stick around and there'll be some time at the end, I'm sure, for additional questions if you think of any additional ones. And then also feel free to follow up via email. Thank you so much, Ashley and Eli. And we're going to pass it on to John. Hi there. Hey, John. All right. Okay. Oh, well. All right. So um, today I'm going to be talking about detecting household occupancy with water and energy data. Um, and I'm going to be talking about both the methods that we can use to do that and applications of, um, of this. So our motivation for this whole study was to, was to ask the question, can household water and energy data be used to reliably detect household occupancy? And um, how this fits into the existing literature um, is interesting because there, there is a lot of uh, literature on detecting occupancy of homes, um, but it often uses technology that isn't in every home. Um, you know, really high resolution energy data is something that you see a lot of uh, where, you know, it's, uh, you know, one minute level data or five minute level data, or it's, you know, things like sensors in each home. So there's definitely an interest in the literature, but there's not a lot that um, uses widely available data. And so one data source is hourly water data um, that isn't super common, but there are a number of large water utilities that have that. Um, as well as hourly energy data, which is quite common um, in the US and especially in California where the um, energy, main energy utilities of the state all have hourly energy data. And so if we can leverage this, then we can perform occupancy analysis on a really wide scale. Um, why would we wanna do this? Well, for one, water and energy utilities could use the, these occupancy classifications to understand their customers better, um, to forecast demand. And, um, you know, and there are some you know, really, really particular policy issues that they might want to use this for. But also, you know, in, in academia, we can use this large scale um, occupancy classification to answer some policy questions or equity questions um, to understand energy use better. Uh, so, um, yeah, so in this, presentation, I'm going to talk about first about detecting occupancy with water data. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how that informed our approach to detecting occupancy with energy data, which is a lot trickier, it turns out. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the applications that we've looked into uh, so far. So our initial study area was a vacation community in Southern California, which is an ideal place to try to um, study occupancy because you have a lot of homes that are occupied sometimes and not occupied other times. In fact, that pattern is kind of predictable. You know, um, this particular vacation community has about 12,000 housing units. Only 3,500 are permanently occupied according to census data, American Community Survey data. Um, and the rest are seasonally occupied. And so they're much more likely to be occupied on a weekend or um, especially like holiday weekends like 4th of July, things like that. And for this vacation community, we got hourly water and energy data for each home. So our you know, initial question was, can we classify which homes are seasonally occupied um, using hourly water data? Um, but to do that, we needed to first detect occupancy for each day for each um, home. So to do that, with water data, we need to identify the water use associated with occupancy, which means we have to remove water use associated with scheduled, um, you know, automatic irrigation and, and remove water use that is associated with leaks 
because um, if you have a leak in your household but you're not there, it'll show up as some water use during that day, but it doesn't mean you're actually home. And so once we've um, you know, removed those and we're identifying water use only associated with occupancy, then we just need to see, you know, is there that kind of water use on a given day? Um, and so this overall approach, you know, it's not very technically, um, you know, high level, there's no high level math, it's just using what, what I'm calling heuristics. You know, we're kind of looking at the data and making rules to determine whether or not a home is occupied. And so this is an example of a home. Each column is an hour in the day, each row is a day. And um, if there's a number in a column um, greater than zero, that means that the water meter measured an additional, um, you know, cubic foot or more of, of water use at, in that hour. And so, you know, we see some days where it's all zero, some days where there's some sporadic water use. You know, this is sort of a heuristically simple to say, you know, these days are unoccupied and these days are occupied. Um, but we run into some issues when there is water use that's not associated with occupancy. And this is a really clear example of irrigation. You see, you know, each Wednesday, Friday and Sunday, there's these really big water uses early in the morning, you know, that are really kind of much higher than any other water use and they're really consistent. And so we just write a simple rule to say, look for these consistent signals on the same weekdays and, you know, flag them as associated with irrigation, remove those and then just run our simple, is there water use heuristic? Um, or and this is the other issue, which is leaks. So see all these sporadic measurements of one cubic foot. You know, with the way these, these meters work is they're not measuring the exact amount used each hour. They're measuring when an additional cubic foot of water has been consumed. So, you know, a bunch of zeros and a one could just mean that there is like 0.2 cubic feet of water used every single hour and it finally ticks over to one. So a day where it's just leaks, you know, you would see these repeated measurements of one cubic foot separated by zero. So again, I just wrote a simple rule to say, you know, if a day only has, you know, some sporadic kind of consistent measures throughout the day like that, then it's probably just leaks. So we applied this to every single home in this vacation community to get the occupancy for every single day. And then we looked at all of the homes together to look at the, the patterns of occupancy throughout the whole water utility. And we get this really strong seasonal pattern, um, lowest in the winter, highest in the summer, which fits in with expectations. And we get all of these spikes in occupancy. And so the blue circles are Memorial Day, 4th of July and Labor Day, which we knew going in were gonna be the big vacation weekends. And then these winter peaks that we're detecting are Thanksgiving, Christmas, and President's Day. Again, popular weekends for this vacation community. So everything we are finding um, is kind of confirming to us that there's, you know, we're, we're detecting something that's about right. And also there's sort of this baseline of about 35% of homes that are occupied, which is actually exactly consistent with the number of permanently occupied homes according to the census data. So, we're feeling a lot of confidence um, in how this is working. Um, and another interesting outcome is we got data through 2020, which as you know, COVID happened and that started happening, the lockdowns and everything in around March of 2020. And this red line shows how the occupancy in 2020 was different from all the previous years. And so we have this huge increase in occupancy um, and this increase was also concentrated in homes that are not permanently occupied. And so this is both an interesting result and it gives some confidence in our approach to say that, you know, we're, we're detecting real increases in occupancy um, from, you know, these homes that are seasonally occupied. And what we're measuring is that as a response to COVID, people working from home or whatever it is, they're spending more time, you know, in potentially their vacation home or an Airbnb. Um, and right, and so we also did some additional classification with this and we were able to 
classify around 22% of homes as being likely permanent homeowners and around 8% of homes as being likely renters. We kind of made that distinction with looking at the billing address and how that differed from the service address. And again, that matched really closely with what we were um, hoping to, to, to match with, which was the um, American Community Survey data. But, um, you know, this is really just background and it's, it's important to see that we can do this with water data. Um, and there's a lot that we, you know, a lot of applications for this, but the limitation with water data is that there aren't very many water utilities that have this, this level of information. Um, that is changing, but you know, it, this might not be a really popular thing for some time. So detecting occupancy with hourly energy data has a lot of potential to be really important. Um, th there's a lot we can do with it just because the coverage of hourly energy data is so much greater. Um, but so you know, we need to answer the question, is there as clear of a signal in occupancy in energy data? And um, what we're hoping to do is to use our water-based occupancy detection to help inform a method that just uses hourly energy data. And so this is um, the same home in our vacation community. And you can see the water data on top and the energy data on bottom. And so, you know, the water data, it's showing, you know, zero cubic feet of usage on a bunch of days. And then some days it's showing kind of these really you know, clear, you know, sort of these sporadic but large amounts of water use on weekends. And so it, you know, it's really clear to see just looking at the water data um, when it's occupied. We also get some, um, you know, so, well, so for the first thing to notice with the energy data is that there's energy use all the time. Um, and anybody who studies home energy usage would, would know this going in because there's Empiric load, there's things like your refrigerator, there's all kinds of things that use energy regardless of whether you're there um, doing anything. There is definitely some signal though, you know, uh, you can really clearly see that the energy use is higher um, on these days when people are home. But, you know, it's not always super consistent. I mean, look at this Sunday, you know, we see this strong signal Sunday evening. Um, but here, there's no real change in energy usage. There's, there's nothing to, to immediately detect. Um, so, right, so, you know, we're not going to be able to write a simple of rules just because energy data is so much more variable and there's so many other things that use energy. And we tried to use a lot of the same types of heuristics and it didn't really give us very good results. Um, but one thing that we could try to leverage is the relationship between energy use and temperature. Um, so this is just, this is that same home. And each of these is a day over the course of many years, three or four years. And this is the average temperature of that day. And this is the energy usage of that day. And you can notice how there's a bunch of clusters, you know, down here where no matter what the temperature was, the energy usage was slow and a lot of points up higher. Well, I'm gonna color these with the um, occupancy detection from the water data, and we'll see that this is sort of, you know, those two clusters are exactly the clusters of occupancy. And so what that means is that there's one relationship between energy usage when a home is occupied and a different relationship when the home is unoccupied. Um, these lines are just sort of a local average, you know, this isn't anything a model is telling us, but, um, you know, it's looking at charts like this that, that are informed the method that we came up with. And here, here's some more. And one thing I want you to notice is how different it is for each household. You know, so I think this is the one that we were just looking at and, you know, the relationship between energy use and temperature is kind of flat when it's hotter, but it's, you know, increasing as it gets colder and colder. This one is sort of the opposite. As it gets hot, there's a huge spike in energy usage. So maybe this home has a large AC unit that runs when it gets warm, you know, but it's flat here. But the key thing in all of these is that there's two models. There's a model when the home is occupied and there's a model when the home is unoccupied. And so 
Um, we developed a solution, or we didn't develop it. We, I found a solution by digging through my econometrics textbook. Um, and it's called a latent class linear mixed model. And in this case, I'm essentially fitting two models at the exact same time. Um, and I'm using a, a maximum likelihood estimation method. And so for each point, I'm fitting it to both models simultaneously. And I'm giving it a probability that it belongs to the upper model and the lower model. And so the equation has this this uh, probability called theta that it belongs to the upper model and this other probability, which is just one minus theta, that it belongs to the lower model. And then there's the parameters that you know dictate this. And so I'm using cooling degrees and heating degrees instead of just plotting the relationship with temperature so that I can get a different slope here and a different slope here. Cooling degrees being the so essentially the degrees below 65 and heating degrees being the degrees above 65. And so by, by maximizing um, the likelihood of this equation all at once, I'm both fitting the upper model and the lower model and assigning a probability to each point that it belongs to the upper model or the lower model. And there's a few steps I took to do this. So the first step um, is that this is the just the energy usage in a day for all of the homes. And one thing you'll notice is that it's really right skewed. There's this long right tail. So I did a log transform on that to make it a, you know, a more normal distribution. Um, I estimated just a, a basic linear model uh, to generate sort of these initial parameters. So I'm predicting energy usage based on the cooling degree days and the heating degree days. And then I feed those initial parameters into this model. Um, but now I'm saying that there are two models and the probability that each point, you know, it starts off at 50%, but then the model optimizes and it splits them. And so with just this basic approach, so this is that same household I, I showed you earlier. This is the occupancy detection using water data. And this is the occupancy detection using electricity data. And so, you know, I, I didn't program this model and I didn't tell it, you know, what the water category, you know, classification was, you know, I just followed the exact steps I showed before and it found, you know, strikingly similar relationships in it, in it a really similar overall classification. You know, one thing you can notice on the left is that there are some days that had sort of these higher energy usage that the water method you know, classified as unoccupied. And, you know, so there's some blue down here that the water method again classified as you know, um, occupied when it wasn't. You know, and so this method, you know, we get a different set of results, but you know, it's important to point out that neither of these is sort of the ground truth. These are both estimation methods. We expect disagreement, um, but the overall classification was similar. There are some ones that you know give it. So this is a different home um, and sort of this color, you know, means that the latent class, you know, electricity classification model is really uncertain. You know, blue means it's certain it's occupied, red means it's certain it's unoccupied, but sort of in between, we don't know much. But this, you could see this as a good result because, you know, in fact, there isn't a lot of difference between occupied and unoccupied homes or, or days for this home you know, in these lower temperature settings. So maybe, you know, it's, we want our method to be uncertain in these times. Um, and again, yeah, here's another one that, that's sort of a similar story. You know, there, there isn't this sort of clear signal. Um, so ones like this where, where the signal is less clear, um, that, that's about 20% of homes. Um, so most of them, we are getting a clear signal. I just thought it'd be useful to show some of these in our example. But um, yeah, so we, again, we ran this for every single home. The, the blue line is our electricity, or sorry, is our water-based classification. And the red line is our electricity-based uh, classification. And you see, it, it seems to do really well um, in the peak summer months, um, but it seems to maybe struggle a bit, you know, around winter. I mean, and that's assuming that the water classification strategy is good. But so there's definitely something here um, that's, that's encouraging, you know, it's finding those same peak weekends, you know, 
even if it's not agreeing on every single day, you know, this is definitely showing us that um, there's, there's something to be done with, it, with this method. And even if it's not going to be quite as precise in determining the exact occupancy, it can still be used to, to measure changes in occupancy as, you know, as a result of some event. And so again, I go to COVID, you know, right here is where COVID started. Both the electricity and water method detected that same increase in occupancy. Um, right, so just to say, there seems to be a decent application um, for this method. We also repeated this in a large urban water utility. Um, their AMI water data, that hourly water data, only began in mid 2019. Um, but it, you know, it seems to be a really similar pattern is detecting, you know, it's also detecting, and this is interesting. So these really low dips are holiday weekends again, but since this is an urban water utility, not a vacation community, you know, when it's a vacation weekend, people are leaving. So it's interesting that we're getting that same signal on both, um, both sides. So just a quick look at some applications. Um, I have a, a few thoughts, a few things I've started looking into. One is, you know, COVID-19, we already looked at that a bit. Another one is, do wealthy customers avoid air quality health impacts from wildfires? That's very relevant to California. Another one is, do some people leave to go to cooler places in response to heat waves? So, you know, this is that, you know, COVID chart I showed you earlier. You know, I did some basic regression analysis to say, you know, is there a significant difference in occupancy in Lake Arrowhead? And, you know, there was. This is just a kind of a simple, uh, you know, diff and diff that, that we're seeing here. Or, you know, again, looking at like wildfires. So the vacation communities in Southern California, there have been a lot of wildfires over the years in areas. So all of these dots are the billing addresses of some of these homes and this vacation community. And um, a lot of these customers were impacted. And so I looked at AQI data um, and looked at unhealthy AQI from, from wildfires. And I found, you know, in this case that, you know, unhealthy, you know, smoky air was a strong predictor in people going to this vacation community. Um, you know, what we want to do with that, you know, what applications of that, you know, something that I think I'm, I'm still in development. Um, yeah, so thank you all for listening. Um, definitely want to open it up to questions or, or just any thoughts you might have on applications. Um, this is a method I'm still in develop, you know, in development on, but you know, I'm something I'm excited about and hoping to, uh, maybe write a good paper about. Great. Thanks, John. Really interesting. Very creative. Um, so yeah, if you have questions for John, please, um, Feel free to raise your hand or put a message in the chat. I'll put his email, it's on the slide, but I'll put it in the chat too in case that's easier. All right, any questions? I mean, I think it's, it's super interesting. I mean, I'm trying to think of there's, I, in my mind, there's like so many different applications that could, that could be relevant to. It's interesting to think through. Um, All right, so a question here from Claire about privacy. Um, yeah. So that's certainly that's certainly something to that you definitely want to um, pay attention to. In fact, in my literature review on methods to detect household occupancy, um, I found some papers that were specifically about preventing this from happening by installing devices in your home that randomize your energy use so that nobody could tell whether or not your home. Um, a lot of these were really focused on the really high resolution occupancy detection methods that use this you know five minute energy data. And so those you know were tools people were developing to you know 
know, you know, what time you come home, what time you leave. And I think there are a lot of privacy concerns with that level. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, there are certainly privacy concerns with daily detection as well. I, you know, it seems less invasive to me. Um, but one thing I should mention here is that the data that, you know, we had, that we're using here is not widely available. You know, we had to go through, jump through a lot of hoops to get this data from um, the utilities. We have to store it on a really secure server. You know, this, so this isn't something that anybody could just go out and do. Um, you would have to be, yeah, a academic entity really is the only people, the only group who can reliably access this data. Um, but that's is definitely a good question, something that we have to be cognizant of um, when we're working with this data and, and publishing our results. Um, and what kind of space heating, gas, or electric? That's a great question. Um, we did start to look into some assessor data and um, you know, some, some homes have gas heating, some homes have electric heating. So <clears throat> I think that that's definitely a factor in you know, these, right. So you know, some of these relationships, as it gets colder, there's this strong increase in electricity, whereas in others, there's none. And so I think that, um, you know, we don't have gas data in this case, but I think that that's definitely an element at play here. Um, but also it seems like this method seems to function without, um, uh, you know, us necessarily knowing that beforehand. It's just trying to fit the data that exists as best as possible. And so it seems to be able to adapt to whether or not there's a, a gas or electric heater on its own. <clears throat> 